Uh, Zooming debate. The Honorable Leader of the NDP. I rise today as leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition to indicate that the New Democratic Party of Canada will oppose Bill C-51. And I do so with a deep sense of responsibility because, as you know, over the last several months, horrific terrorist attacks have shocked the world. But at the same time, Mourning those events has brought people together and strengthened our resolve to defend our way of life against cowardly attackers who seek to intimidate us and erode our freedoms. You see, Canadians came together in grief and defiance the day after the Parliament Hill shooting, pledging that violence would not, even for a day, halt the work of our democracy. That day, we were united. We were resolved to keep this land strong and free, to protect our freedoms, to stand by our principles. Le lendemain de la fusillade. The day after the shootings at Parliament, it was important for us to state loud and clear that we had a duty to protect both our homes and our rights. Let us be clear, terrorism is a very real threat at home and abroad. The events of uh, September 11, 2001 changed the face of the world and forced us to take these threats seriously. The Government of Canada invested substantial resources over the past 20 years and it went further by reinforcing its rights to counter terrorism. Over these past two decades, there were several bills that have been presented in this House, and every time the NDP has given a balanced analysis, a, a well-thought-out analysis, sometimes we support these bills, and sometimes we vote against them, as we are about to do today with C-51. It is the same thing when we have complex issues to study with regard to international affairs. You will remember, Mr. Speaker, when this House was called upon to vote upon, on the bombings in Libya against Omar Gaddafi, the NDP voted for this motion when it was a, an international, or rather when, rather when it was a UN mandate. When it was changed into a US mission, we withdrew our support. That is how we are a principled party. Some of the bills that have been, been implemented since 2001 work well. And this is part of uh, some of our comments with regard to the government. It's as if these bills that seem to work well don't even exist. Think back to June 2006. Some 400 police officers participated in the arrest of 18 individuals in Toronto who were planning attacks in public places, including the Peace Tower here in Ottawa and the CN Tower in Toronto. In 2013, recently, because this is still in the news, the RCMP thwarted a conspiracy to attack a via rail train. Since the beginning of 2015 alone, police officers have brought charges against six individuals right here in the Ottawa area for having participated in terrorist group activities and facilitating these activities. Mr. Speaker, there are laws in place for that. The current system works. It is conclusive. It delivers results and it works. In the opinion of the NDP, current legislation allows right now police officers and RCMP to do their work properly, giving new legislative tools 
to them is not the only solution. First and foremost, we must ensure that our officers have the financial resources required to allow them to better enforce our laws. In fact, a certain acts that have been adopted to counter terrorism have never been used by the police forces. But, in any case, the NDP has always risen in this House to ask questions about each new bill at each legislative stage on the measures proposed by the government. Because the NDP believes that security and freedom are fundamental values that must be preserved at all costs. Bravo. We also believe that both security and freedom go hand in hand and that it is countries where the citizens that are the freest that are the safest countries. I fundamentally believe that the primary duty of any government is to ensure the security and safety of these citizens. Now that includes the obligation to ensure, for example, food safety. By, through ideology, we no longer have a government inspector in meat processing plants. There is a system of self-regulation where the company decides whether it's doing good work. Now that is, has something to do with the fact that with this government we saw dozens of Canadians die further to the Lysteria crisis. That is another obligation to protect the public, and they failed at this task, and they even made irresponsible and tasteless, tasteless jokes in this regard. And the person who made these jokes is still the Minister of Agriculture. That's a shame, Mr. Speaker. It's shameful. We have the obligation to ensure the safety of the transport of dangerous goods. But we've seen the results of that. Once again, it is an ideological vision on the part of this government to allow railway companies to self-regulate, to check off a checkbox on a piece of paper and say to the government, yes, we are doing our job. We will never forget that one of the only railways in Canada that had special permission from this Conservative government to have only one conductor aboard the train was the railway company that who, whose car exploded at Lac Megansic. There again, 50 people died, and that's another responsibility of the federal government. So we must ensure that the public is safe in all spheres of activity. And yet by putting in place a legislative framework, financial resources need also be to be provided so that police officers and intelligence services can do their job and protect Canadians. Because what happened in the meat processing plants is the result of a system of self-regulation and budget cuts of millions of dollars and hundreds of jobs in the Canada Food Inspection Agency. What happened with the railways is the same thing. The voluntary self-regulation system means that the government is not doing its job. And we could go on and on about sectors where the government has simply turned its back or not gone forward. The Parliamentary Committee on Justice voted on a bill to uh, to crack down on drunk drivers. And yet they love to have photo ops with the mothers of people who have mothers of uh, young people who have died because of drunk drivers. But they have never gone further with that. And yet those kind of changes would have saved saved hundreds of lives. That too, Mr. Speaker, that is public protection. There's no question, Mr. Speaker, that terrorism is a real threat, both here at home and abroad. Taking effective action to protect public safety must be the top priority for any government. But we, as parliamentarians, also have a, 
an obligation to protect Canadians' way of life, to stand up for our freedoms and our values. Parliament, parliamentarians must come together to address this threat with responsible, effective measures that are targeting the threat, not playing political games as we saw today. But at a time when we need a responsible and serious approach to this threat that protects Canadians' values and freedoms, we saw the Prime Minister playing games, putting the freedoms of Canadians at risk. As you saw today, we asked him five times to provide one single example, and he was incapable of doing it. You know why? Because this is a political play more than anything else. Yes. The Conservatives have even admitted it. They see the recent events, as one of their officials put it, as a, quote, strategic opportunity for them. So Canadians are right to suspect that the Prime Minister's new anti-terror bill, C-51, goes too far. The NDP team analyzed and studied this bill inside and out and consulted with society stakeholders to determine whether the Conservatives' new approach was both effective in protecting Canadians and in protecting our civil liberties. We have also put numerous questions to the Prime Minister and the ministers responsible and try, try to provide some clarification, but they're just simply not able to answer. That is conclusive proof that they are playing political games. Unlike the Liberals, who threw their support behind this bill without, even had, without having even read it, and shirking any responsibility for negotiating amendments, the NDP took the time to read this bill. It is voluminous and complex, but we reflected and analyzed on it. Analyzed it. The NDP will not support this bill in its current form because there are too many problems that will definitely undermine and curb Canadians' rights and freedoms. After consulting with experts, talking with Canadians, after lengthy democratic discussions in our own caucus, the NDP has come to this conclusion. The Prime Minister's approach is one we cannot and one we shall not support. <laughs> Bill C-51 is sweeping, dangerously vague, and ineffective. It doesn't do things that are proven to work, and it puts politics ahead of protecting Canadians. Now, why do I say that? Well, instead of introducing this legislation, as he should have right here in Parliament, the Prime Minister chose to do it in an election-like, campaign-style event. That's called tipping your hand, Mr. Speaker. He even went so far as to make remarks that singled out Canada's Muslim community. That's not leadership that unites Canadians, and he should be ashamed of himself, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Canadians are being told by this Prime Minister that they need to choose between their security and their rights that safety and freedom are somehow, in their minds, mutually exclusive. It's the classic conservative political approach, not based on good policy, but entirely on what they see as good partisan politics. To drive wedges, to put one region against another, one community against another, to create false choices. Prime Minister, it is not the environment or the economy it is both. It is not free trade or human rights. It is both. And it is not public safety or freedom. It is both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, what the Conservatives are proposing once again is a false choice. We should not have to choose between our freedom and our safety. 
we it had imperiously had the obligation to protect both all the time and in every single way for everyone. We can have both at the same time, and we must have both at the same time. And you know what, Mr. Speaker? We are convinced that we are able to preserve both. Decided to put forward concrete measures to make Canadians safer and protect our freedoms. Instead, the Conservatives have once again put politics over principle and introduced a bill that is so broad it would allow CSIS to investigate anyone who opposes the government's economic, social, or environmental policies. C-51 proposes to give CSIS a sweeping new mandate to, quote, disrupt, unquote, the activities of people or groups it doesn't like, that it believes it poses any kind of threat under any of those chapters. What's happened to the rule of law in our country, Mr. Speaker? Here, here, here. We've been asking the Minister for Public Safety to explain what that means. He has been entirely incapable. Neither he, nor his officials, nor the Prime Minister for that matter, have been willing or able to describe what activities this new mandate would cover. Again, Mr. Speaker, anyone who was here today at question period saw what happened. A Prime Minister wholly incapable of providing a single example of what this bill was supposed to correct as mischief. That's because it is a political ploy. But according to the brilliant and talented Minister of Public Safety, we should not get bogged down in definitions as we just saw through his speech. He just uh, gets, he uses cliches and uses the talking points of the Prime Minister's office, uh, the office that do not mean anything. But that is the very essence of the rule of law. That's what that is. It is the very wording of the law. It is the version of the law. It is what is written in the law, the substance of the law. And that is why he is unable to talk about it, because he does not even understand what he has written in his law. In order for everything to be clear and for and so that everyone can understand and interpret the bill correctly in the same way, let us be clear. They would, even if they, if, if they had wanted to do this properly, they would have started with Parliament. They should have, they would have announced that experts would have, would study the bill. And instead, we had a campaign style announcement hundreds of kilometers away from Parliament. And that is the very betrayal of deep thought. This is a political ploy, Mr. Speaker. But those experts who are starting to write about this, highly respected individuals, are starting to warn that the broad measures in Bill C-51 could lump legal dissent together with terrorism. Strikers lumped together with violent anarchists. C-51 proposes to make it an offense to, quote, advocate or promote terrorism in general. In general. Can the minister even explain what those words are doing in a legal text in general? Canada already has strong laws that make it an offense to incite a terrorist act. That's why they can't give a single example of what is taken care of by this new bill that isn't already taken care of by existing legislation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those same experts, and we're seeing more and more of their papers appear, are saying that the language in this new provision is so vague and so open-ended that it could vastly expand the kind of statements that could get a Canadian arrested. Anyone who is genuinely inciting violence against others, of course, should be stopped. But we need measures that keep Canadians safe without eroding our fundamental freedoms. Yeah. When a government plays with fear, 
that should be the title of this government, the government of fear. When a government toys with people's fear and they toy with their emotions after a tragedy, the risks are higher that we shall find ourselves uh, abusing of the situation. Like many Quebecers, I remember the arrest and abusive detention of hundreds of innocents when the Liberal Party of Canada under Trudeau adopted the Law of War Measures Act during the October crisis. And at the time, despite the criticisms, the NDP had the courage of its convictions and stood up it opposed this attack on the rights and freedoms of all Canadians. And Mr. Speaker, it was hard at the time, but history proved us to be right, and we're proud of that. C'est le rôle de it is the role of all parliamentarians to ensure that such abuses never happen again. Those who don't learn from the errors of the past are condemned to repeating them, and that's what we're seeing today. ...new powers to cease us without addressing serious deficiencies in oversight. We do know that there are currently serious deficiencies in oversight of CSIS. The last report of the Under-Resourced Security Intelligence Review Committee found that CSIS is, quote, seriously misleading the committee in one investigation after another and Ooh. faced difficulties, that's their term, and significant delays in getting information about the spy agency's activities. In other words, they're hiding the information from the people who are supposed to be guaranteeing oversight because the oversight is deficient, ineffective, and weak. That's the reality, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. That's before the enhanced responsibilities. It's already problematic. Nous sommes préoccupés par... We are concerned by the fact that the Conservatives want to give more powers to CSIS, the Canadian Security Intelligence agency without improving the oversight mechanism that's defective that's already in place and they gave us the appointment for example at the man known as arthur porter he put him in charge they put him in charge of oversight for them he's the very model of an ethical person for us the logic is simple if we want to strengthen the powers of circ we must absolutely, or cease us rather, we must absolutely strengthen the oversight as well. That's imperative, Mr. Speaker. Oh, by the way, this is on top of the Conservative decision in 2012 to simply eliminate the position of CSIS Inspector General. Yeah. Yeah. That, of course, further weakened the reviews. But you know what, Mr. Speaker? That's exactly what they wanted. That's right. Yeah. In view of these shortcomings, it's simply irresponsible to give the agency such broad new powers without providing additional oversight and without in any way attempting to prove what such new powers are supposed to do that isn't already in the law. The bill also comes on the heels of cuts to our security agencies, cuts that sideline other public safety priorities. And the Prime Minister has yet to offer a plan to support Canadian communities that are combating radicalization on the ground. No stranger to the threat of terrorism, the United States of America, under President Obama, has taken a proactive approach to combating radicalization. The White House has spearheaded work with at-risk communities to make them more resilient against the lure of radicalization. The U.S. government works to support community and faith leaders by connecting them with counter-radicalization experts, providing information on how to recognize the warning signs of radicalization, and training in the time, kinds of tactics that are proven to actually work, to defuse radicalization. Yeah. Yeah. 
absolutely none of this is being done in Canada by the Conservatives. In fact, the Conservatives have chosen a very different approach. For example, the RCMP plan to work with communities to counter violent extremism has sat on the drawing board for years. Why? It doesn't suit their purpose. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister has cut the budgets of both the RCMP and CSIS, and top officials have testified that they do not have the resources to monitor terrorism suspects and keep fully funding other areas of their policing. Why? Because they prefer to talk about it more than they do anything about it. Instead of doing the things that are proven to work, this bill sees the Conservatives once again putting wedge politics ahead of protecting Canadians. Le projet de loi C5. Bill C-51 says nothing about one component that we consider to be critical if we want to attack the very roots of terrorism. Canada must have a strategy to fight radicalization that is occurring here at home. We want there to be more measures to help communities and that is what they are asking for. They are asking us to do this important work of education. By radicalization, terrorism and attacks by disturbed lone wolves merits a real debate. But by seeking to divide and score points, the Conservatives have succeeded in intimidating the Liberals into giving them a blank check to pass any law, even before they are tabled, and even when they go too far. They say that they are going to write a little something on the memo line, but it's still going to be a blank check, Mr. Speaker. Because the truth is, if we cannot protect our freedoms, then we are sacrificing our freedoms. Freedom and public safety have to go hand in hand. We will hold true to our principles and oppose this overreaching legislation. Our rights and freedoms define our Canadian way of life. And so long as I am here, no one is going to undermine who we are and what we stand for as Canadians. Here, here. Here, here. Here, here. So in coming days, in coming weeks, and in coming months, we urge the government to resist their normal urge to try to railroad legislation through. They have broken all records for using the guillotine to pass things faster. They've used time allocation and closure more than any other government in the history of Canada. But there are a few things that we've ever looked at in this House that are more important than we're looking at right now. It deserves serious analysis. It deserves the time to hear the experts who have a lot to bring to this debate. We will be proposing amendments and we hope the government will listen to our proposals at their merit and listen to the experts who come to committee, Mr. Speaker. Indeed, we hope that they will not only invite experts to committee, we hope that they will invite community leaders as well. That's right. These are people we should also be listening to. These are people on the front lines who often have to deal with young people who are facing the siren song of radicalization. We should be listening to them, and we should be putting in place the types of solutions that they'll be talking to us about. We also urge the Liberals to reconsider their position to support this bill unconditionally. We hope that we all, as parliamentarians, will take this bill seriously. Here I want to salute the leader of the Green Party who has also raised serious concerns about Bill C-51. We hope Conservative MPs will be willing to consider practical amendments to strengthen oversight and protect Canadians' freedoms. Free societies, Mr. Speaker, are safe societies. Canadians can count on New Democrats to take a principled stand against this and any conservative law that undermines the freedoms and values that define our Canadian way of life. Here, here. A 
Et comme je l'ai dit au premier ministre... And as I said to the Prime Minister the day after the shooting here in Ottawa, when I asked him if he was going to be able, as an individual, to resist at this heavy-handed tendency of always attacking people who are against him and his positions, I asked him if he was able to understood, understand, if he could have a broader perspective that even if we didn't agree on how to achieve these things, that all parliamentarians want the same thing, we, the protection of Canadians, we all agree that. And we saw once today that he's not capable of taking such a position. But I know that all parliamentarians, in fact all Canadians, want to live in safety and security and in peace. We all want to eradicate terrorism. And in this debate, which is sometimes emotional, no one should play political games. And the NDP is going to do everything so that the government will improve its bill. It is our duty as legislators to put intelligence and effective policies in place to ensure the protection of Canadians. We cannot make any compromises between freedoms and security. We must protect both at the same time, at all times, Mr. Speaker. In conclusion, Mr. Speaker, let's just say the following, that if we do not stand up to fear, it will be those who terrorize us who will claim the fear. Questions and comments. The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I note that in his speech, the Leader of the Opposition neglected to mention that the expansion of CSIS's powers, um, that, uh, that also CERC's powers are expanded as well. So I would, there were allusions and there was rhetoric in the um, speech that we just heard. We'll uh, leave uh, those aside. But on the substance of the debate, Mr. Speaker, are, he asked if there were concrete measures in this bill. Well, let's take the very first one, which is very simple. The sharing of information within federal entities. Now, how can the leader of the opposition be against that sharing of information when it has the goal of protecting Canadians? We saw with revoked passports at, uh, that uh, there, they, these officials were not even able to disclose the things that might be a threat to our safety as Canadians. So how, it is, why is he opposed to this bill, the leader of the official opposition? Well, well let's take in order what the uh, minister has referred to, because what he's just said in terms of broadening of oversight is completely and irrefutably false. There is nothing absolutely zilch in this bill that will increase in any way whatsoever the oversight powers over CSIS. It's completely and absolutely false. And there is compelling evidence to this. If, if the minister really read the bill, he's having a problem understanding it, because this bill, five times this afternoon, we had the opportunity to ask the Prime Minister, in my case, and in many cases with other MPs today, we had the opportunity to ask him to provide us with a single example, one single example, of some action that under this bill would be found to, deemed to be criminal that isn't already illegal under existing legislation. 
and so there were they scare, skirted the issue and uh, we got all kinds of a show here but uh, we always came back to the point of departure there was no ability to determine to or to say that this bill makes something illegal that's not already illegal in Canada so that is shows that it is a purely political gesture on the part of the conservatives Questions and comments. Questions and comments. The honourable member for Ottawa Vanier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we share some of the concerns of the leader of the official opposition, and we have the intention also of presenting amendments, for example, to ensure that there is parliamentary oversight, and to uh, put in a sunset clause where there's a mandatory review. But also, Mr. Speaker, my leader to the leader of the opposition is: Does he really believe that? the government across the way will accept proposed amendments either from the official opposition or from our party, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, while I thank the member for uh, his comments, I have to remind of, of, of a few facts. A few months back when the government tabled an undemocratic bill that would undo certain guarantees under the Elections Act, the Liberal Party had a press uh, a presser and they, and they said there's nothing to be done about it. Uh, they have a majority, but when we are uh, in the government, we'll change it. So that's arrogance and incompetence because they presume that uh, doing nothing, people will elect them. And incompetence because they're not fulfilling their primary duty as a party of the opposition. But I read with great interest a letter written by the same Liberal member last week where he very criticized in great detail the idea of bringing the RCMP here to manage things in the House. And what happened when this one came to a vote? They forgot to vote. So they basically gave it over to the Conservatives through indolence. Now there are limits, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Squamish Wan de Fuga. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the Leader of the Opposition for his remarks on this bill because, as usual, he's elevated the debate in this House, very clearly laying out what's at stake uh, with this bill. What I want to ask him is something he talked about at the beginning of his speech and then reflected on at the end. And that is, we all came together in this House the day after the shooting on Parliament Hill with a commitment that we would not let those who would use violence harm our democracy or our open society. And uh, there was an expression on all, all sides of this House that we would cooperate and work together to make sure that was the case. What does the Leader of the Opposition think happened to that uh, sentiment or that feeling that was so strong on that one day and seems so absent now in this House? We are a long way from the hug I got from my bro across. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the French have a good expression, chasser le naturel, il revient au galop. Uh, when you, the natural tendencies, they come galloping back. And I think that that's what we've seen here. When this bill was announced, not in Parliament, not with respect for this institution, but as a purely partisan ploy, hundreds of kilometers away from here, Canadians immediately understood that this was just another piece being moved on a board of a game being played by the Conservatives. This is their trademark, telling Canadians that they have to be afraid, that we have to sacrifice our freedoms if we want to be able to ensure our security. We know, Mr. Speaker, that it's possible to do both. We're going to work hard in Parliamentary Committee to bring forward amendments that would accomplish that. We'll bring in experts if the government doesn't try to railroad it through. We'll bring in people who can talk to what could be done constructively in communities across Canada. If our goal is to strengthen security, we'll be there every step of the way. If the goal of the Conservatives is to play politics, we will stand up to them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Desneffi, Mississippi, Churchill River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
was quite interesting listening to my colleague across the floor. I look back to uh, July 7, 2006, where I had three of my members in the RCMP were shot. Uh, two passed away seven days later. And I listened to rhetoric here. <sighs> you can laugh about it. It's not funny. Anyway, Mr. Speaker, listening to this, this is about protecting Canadians. This is about protecting the law enforcement officers on the streets that have to do the daily battles against everyone. This is about protecting our men and women in the services. And this is about protecting all Canadians. And then when I hear the colleague across the floor, if they let me finish, the NDP, I, their position is hug a thug day. I don't agree with that. And when you hear about this, and this is about respecting my colleagues who passed away. You hear about the abuses and about protecting Canadian freedoms. I look back to 2013 where my colleague drove on the hill and was trying to be pulled over by the RCMP. And then what he does, Mr. Speaker, he says, do you know who I am? That's not about respecting the, the institution. What I'm looking at, Mr. Speaker, is that they voted to keep traveling for terrorist purposes legal. They voted to allow convicted terrorists to keep the citizenship. They voted to stop our security agencies from cooperating with our allies. And now they express concerns about the important time of legislation. Order. 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 The, uh, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. No doubt unwittingly, the member has just done us all a service. Because if there was any lingering doubt in anyone's mind that this is simply a political ploy, he's removed all doubt. There's nothing in the bill about any of the things he's just mentioned. It also shows that, like the minister, he hasn't even read it, which is also bringing us straight back to what is actually driving this, the Prime Minister's office and the Conservatives' politics for the next election. We're going to stand up on a question of principle. We know that it is possible, and it's indeed primordial for any government to defend both our security and our rights. I very much regret that someone who believes he once enforced the law doesn't understand the importance of protecting Canadians' rights. Here, here.